Hi, welcome to the second half of Cambridge Inside Out. I'm Judy Nathans. And I'm Robert Winters. And our special guest. I'm Adrienne Musgrave. Yes. And Adrian is uh, a, a yet another candidate for Cambridge City Council. That's right. 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 We just had uh, Sean Tierney in the first half. We have Adrian for the second half today. Uh, and uh, so, Adrian, why don't you uh, why don't you tell the folks at home yeah. a little bit about yourself? Right. Yeah. So um, I have been living in Cambridge for almost ten years. Been in the Boston area for over fifteen, and I love Cambridge. I think we are just so lucky to live here. Uh, literally, you know, the ideas and people that run the world live in Cambridge or start in Cambridge. So to be here is a real privilege and um, it's an honor and I would be very honored to be on the city council. The reason I'm running is mm -hmm. I have always really been interested in government and society and what we can do to make sort of our communities, a better place to live. Um, and so I started my career off as an intern in Don Carey's office. Mm -hmm. I did some fundraising for the DNC and for the ACLU when I was in Washington. And so this has been something that's a part of my life for a really long time. And like many people, I think probably almost everyone in Cambridge, last November hit really hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really, really, really hard. And... Um, when I kept thinking about what can we do, what should we do, I signed up for all the resistance groups, I start, started making phone calls again, um, and then I realized that we can't just resist, we have to continue to progress. Mm -hmm. And so while I've been interested in local issues for a really long time, I felt like now was the time for all of us to reinvest ourselves at the local level here in Cambridge and also at the state level if you're not already because the things that are happening nationally do have a role here um, in our city right now. So that's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's pretty fair. Uh, you know, I've actually been uh, speculating for some time to what degree the sort of national politics who are going to distill down into the local level for mm -hmm. Cambridge politics, you know. I mean, the job of a city council is, I mean, it's clearly, it's not just like getting potholes fixed and the streets paved and whatever. There are some sort of big issues as well here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think this is probably <coughs> going to be a banner year for candidates who are, uh, you know, sort of taking inspiration from sort of more national level uh, uh, matters and sort of driving them into running for office locally. I hope so, and I hope that means that there's going to be more people voting in local elections as well. Um, yeah, people realizing, younger people realizing that this really matters. And as we start to take more leadership positions, I'm 31, and um, you know we're going to have to start engaging our community just like Canterburyans who've been here for decades. You mean that. like me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I asked you this earlier. Where's yeah. the next Robert Winters? That's right. <laughs> so what is, how are you going to connect to that, that younger vote? I mean, what do you think is their burning issue that somewhat relates to the national scene or that yeah. you affected in the city I council? Think, um, I think there's quite a few here that we're experiencing. So at a national level, we're talking about inequality. And that's happening here in Cambridge, too. Um, we're talking about equity on a national um, level, whether that's you know, economic equity, racial equity, where you live. Um, you know, it, this, Obama said it when he uh, launched his housing initiative. Unfortunately, the zip code you live in determines a lot of your fate. Mm -hmm. And so the more people we can have living in Cambridge to open up this amazing community to more people um, would be a great thing for us to do. Because it gets a little trickier in Cambridge because you can right. live in 02139 and be a, a high-end uh, $200,000 yeah. salaried person or you could be somebody living in public housing in 02139. True, maybe Who's, 20 years ago. You know, living in the ago. shadow of the development of, Ken, you know, of the, the biotech industry of Kendall Square and having a hard time finding a job. So, yeah. Can so I ask, so what have you done, what interests locally have you been more involved with, either as directly or um, following? 
Yeah, so I'm on the board of a national nonprofit called Interise, and we work with small business owners in areas of concentrated poverty across the country mm -hmm. to give them the knowledge network and know-how to scale their businesses. Mm -hmm. So these are companies that are um, have already reached a certain level of success, but they've kind of hit a ceiling, and they're not quite sure how to take it to the next level. And so when you look at economic development, this this segment of business is where a lot of the jobs come from. This is where a lot of the growth comes from. Um, but unfortunately, sort of uh, capability in these businesses and these business owners and their teams, um, they're desperate for more support and more knowledge and more training. Um, and then they're also desperate for more capital. So providing liquid funding to put a down payment on a lease, um, to add in equipment, um, would help these businesses grow. So how is Cambridge doing that? So Cambridge is really lucky. Um, Cambridge is not in one of these areas of extreme con er yeah. concentrated poverty. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we talk a lot about are um, anchor institutions. And so we have a lot of hospitals in this area. And so one of the things our hospitals can do, um, along with city government, I think one thing that city government can do is foster uh, sort of bringing stakeholders together and so bringing these stakeholders together to talk about what do you need in your anchor institution sort of procurement processes um, to help with that setup. Yeah. Yeah. This, this uh, actually triggers some recollections of I, I went to one of these uh, you know this Envision Cambridge process is going on it's sort of a citywide planning process but they actually have these sort of sub areas and working mm -hmm. groups one of which is the economy. Right. You know, and since I'm on the advisory committee, I thought maybe I'd go to some of these working groups just to kind of see what everybody's up to. You know, and some of the things you're just talking about are very much, very much consistent with what we're talking about with the Envision Cambridge Economy Working Group. You know, so some of the things which are a little outside of my uh, sphere of knowledge, really, about what the needs of uh, businesses and, and things really are, what people are looking for. Yeah. And the challenge here, I think, that we're also experiencing at a national level and even sort of global issue is a lot of our businesses are competing with online retailers and so that's putting a ton of pressure on them and so um, you know forming more coalitions for businesses to talk to perhaps younger folks who are in these online um, businesses and to help them understand uh, what does this mean to have a Facebook presence? What does it mean to have an online store? How are you going to integrate that into uh, your sales process, your operations? It's it's really tough. It's really, really tough, but providing some of those connections. Um, well, Judy and I, we, we went to a, these a retail, what's strategy. it called? Retail strategy meeting the city came yeah, is actually doing right that. Right and I'm not sure if people yeah. even say things like, well, maybe in a few years we won't have retail because, which is a horrible thing to even but think about. But it was about. actually still only a small percent though. Yeah. I mean, it's only, what, 3% online sales? I mean, it wasn't really like this, everybody's buying everything. You're still going to have places people go to. But right. they did talk about helping businesses um, do what you just said. Uh, giving them that social media, you know, uh, savvy stuff, and that was one of the recommendations, I think. Mm -hmm. Ways to compete yeah. with Amazon. What are some strategies that you can do? Offering, you know, exclusive clothing. I think offering as the millennial group, as the millennial cohort, as their um, sort of spend increases. You know, what are ways that you can capture some of that spend? Um, you know, they like unique items, um, exclusivity. Um, a lot of story behind the items. These are things that are trends in that space. Right. Stuff that I've done a lot um, in my in my career. Is your Looking career more into. in business or market? Yeah. Business? So um, I've done a, quite a few things. So mm -hmm. early on in my career, I worked at a cross cultural consulting firm, and we helped business executives from all around the world go all around the world and. Um, figure out what their culture was going to be. Mm -hmm. And so this wasn't just, uh, where do I shop? This was, how do I conduct my meeting? What are their expectations? Right. Important. Yeah. Um, what's the difference? How do they view hierarchy? What's the level of communication? Um, and the interesting thing about that was um, it wasn't just Americans moving to Europe or Americans moving to mm -hmm. um, South America. It was 
Europeans yeah, moving to China yeah, and yeah, Indians yeah, yeah. moving to South America. So yeah. there was this broad view of mm-hmm. sort of international business and how to create sort of cross-cultural connections and awareness from that. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite fun facts, just as a um, point of interest, we, um, so it's hugely expensive to um, have an international expat um, go abroad. And the, uh, the, the rate of failure for Americans to go to the UK is one of the highest. And people are always really surprised why that would be. And um, what we would always talk about is that going to another country, a big part of it is what your expectations are. And we have so much in common with the UK and so that we expect mm-hmm. it to be really yeah. similar. But in fact, it's, it's not. So while mm-hmm. things on the surface might seem similar, mm-hmm. culture is below the surface. Yeah. So we like to use that iceberg metaphor. that's even the metaphor. same language. I can imagine with <laughs> different languages. <laughs> Yeah, so I did that for a little while, and then um, I helped start Boston University's Global Operations and Strategy Group, and so this was a new initiative within higher ed, and it was, you know, BU's one of the first global Mm -hmm. universities, um, and they have 30,000 undergrads and professors and staff researchers flying all around the world, Mm -hmm. but until that time, the university hadn't really thought about a centralized sort of framework for how it could think about its so when did, presence when abroad. So when was that? When did you start that? Oh, when was that? That was in uh, 2010. Hmm. And so we started that office, um, the study abroad office, the international students and scholars office, and then our English language program um, was also underneath this group. And we were thinking, what was the program um, what was BU's presence abroad going to be, mm-hmm. and what's the culture of um, like on campus? Sure. What's a way for sort of our American students and our international mm-hmm. students to mix? Mm-hmm. Well, let me just try to bring things right back to the, sort of the, yeah. I guess sort of yeah. the topic of the hour. You know, yeah. As I think we mentioned earlier, the um, nomination papers are going to be available for candidates come July third. Uh, and have to come back July 31st. Nobody's really a candidate until basically they're on the ballot, really. Mm -hmm. But um, we have about 20 candidates. uh, At least it seems to be about 20 candidates right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, are there any particular uh, things that you feel that maybe sort of distinguishes you from... I mean, mean, I'm not presuming you even know all the candidates you see, Mm -hmm. right? But, you know, maybe you've met some of them uh, and whatever. Uh, well, you know the incumbents. You, I mean, most you people know the incumbents, that, yeah. whatever. So are there, are there any particular yeah. things you feel you will add? It will yeah, that, somehow that's missing now or... Either missing or, or you can, you can uh, create. It's not loud enough. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, as I have come to learn, uh, I don't think people in Cambridge are, are shy about voicing their opinions. No. So <laughs> the risk of not being loud enough, I mm-hmm. think, is there. Uh, I would say that as sort of the younger generation... Uh, sort of comes up and rises. I think that um, that viewpoint is important to consider. Um, I we only have twenty two percent of our council represented by women, and so I would really like to see that go to fifty percent. This council, I think that we can do that in Cambridge. I uh, I commute, and so I'm very very excited about all of the bike advocacy that lots of folks have done. And I look forward to continuing to push that forward. And then I think, you know, one of the issues that we have as being in a city with more people wanting to live here is around how are we going to sort of create new communities when more people are living here. We do have more development coming. Um, The Volpe Center is on the docket. There's a lot of discussion around North Point. There's a lot of discussion um, around Lechmere. And so... What does that look like from a space consideration? What does that look like from services? And I think we're going to have to look to more public, private, nonprofit community partnerships. And so I think that from my perspective of having worked in the city and worked with a lot of these private corporations, um, I think that I have a unique perspective in how to make that happen. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I was up at an event uh, just a week or something ago up in the quadrangle and uh, people do, t- now it's sort of, it's, you would, it's almost like farmland with, with, yeah. with uh, warehouses, right? 
you know, and, and the truth is, you know, for many of us who've been around a long, long time, we tend to think of Harvard, of, uh, um, Harvard Square, Central Square, Inman Square, Kendall Square, sort of as defining the city by certain squares. Mm -hmm. But there actually are some emerging parts of the city, mm -hmm. whether it's North Point mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. um, one of these Pond, days, yeah. you know, I think Fresh Pond could become uh, a center. I actually was at a, mm -hmm. uh, one of these Envision Cambridge meetings where they were talking about pretty fancifully about different ways of completely re-envisioning that old area. Yeah, so getting it's rid of the just, rotary, maybe? Right. Because well, that's the People biggest. talk about even covering it, which I think whatever. maybe that's a little yeah. too much, whatever. Well, yeah. But, you know, there are some the sort of big right ideas now. that yeah. can still be had here in mm. some emerging neighborhoods, I think it's fair to say, you know. So, yeah, so, um, so you mentioned uh, uh, the desire, you know, the laudable desire of having uh, better representation of women on the city council. Right. Um, so. Uh, age, yeah, who's, well, not, I mean, you are young. Right, I mean, you, it's <laughs> funny, I never consider myself I know, part of a younger cohort <laughs> when we're talking about the. <laughs> the youngest counselor is Nadine. He's in his uh, 30s. Uh, amongst 30s, the elected right? ones, that's, yeah. that and might be true. Everyone else is 40 and up, right? Uh, the governor's in his 40s. And I think more than, mostly, yeah, yeah considerably so. 40 to 70. Uh, the oldest yes. is 70, yeah, uh, and the youngest is, well, actually... Yeah. yeah no, I'm I think, talking about the current right now. Yeah. Um, so I guess yeah. it probably needed yeah. yeah. uh, yeah. Other than that, it would be... Um, oh, well, Leland, Leland, Chung. Leland, that's true. Yeah. Leland is pretty young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, I mean, it, this yeah. kind of... There's a... Yeah. There is, yeah, I well, think we're Leland's definitely... Leland's almost 40, so... Right. Whatever. Well, we're, we're <laughs> definitely... <laughs> younger. I think yeah. we are definitely looking yeah. at, yeah. at a, a kind of a, 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 a shift... Yeah. You know, in the, you know, sure. there are two vacancies on the city council. Yeah, uh, there'll be at least two mm -hmm. new faces. Uh, I think it'll, it'll probably be younger city yeah. council mm -hmm. um, as you said, we move on. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, hopefully kind of more women. You're right. Yeah. Right. So I'm also involved in an organization called the Philanthropy Connection. It's mm -hmm. a women's giving circle that has just been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, we have a different sort of view of philanthropy, which is, yes, you can give money and nonprofits desperately need more funding. But the other thing you can give is your time and your knowledge and your connections and enthusiasm. And so it's broader than just sort of a way to donate, although mm -hmm. we do that. Mm -hmm. um, we give out a quarter million dollars every year because mm -hmm. we all pool our money together. And what's really I think beautiful about the organization, it was started by um, Marla Fletcher, who's in sort of the greater Porter Square area. So um, it's a local? It's just Cambridge? It's local, yeah. Well, um, it's not just Cambridge, it's but sort it, of the greater Boston area, and okay, then the all of the Boston. donations are within, are for organizations I within see. the 495 okay. loop. Um, what's really been remarkable about that is we have a sizable group of younger folks, 35 and under, um, that have the chance to connect with um, sort of older women. And it's been wonderful. We have great conversations. Um, but you're we all learn so much. You all come with resources. Um, we and, all come with an interest uh -huh. in contributing. Uh -huh. And so for the younger cohort, the. They may have less. It, there's a less time. Well, well there's, a, there's a little bit more time, mm -hmm. and then there's less of a financial incentive knowing mm -hmm. that we're earlier in our careers and don't mm -hmm. have the full breadth. Yeah. And so I think it's just a really great lesson for how do you create some of the cross dialogue um, mm -hmm. and cross learnings, mm -hmm. whether that's at the council level, whether that's especially through Envision Cambridge, through nonprofits, you know, sort of having different perspectives means a lot. It's not just who can fill what bucket. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the topics that's been uh, under discussion at the city council level lately, largely spurred by it, it was a community uh, benefits mitigation mm -hmm. fund. I forget there's multiple ones uh, that were created. Actually, kind of grew out of some of the developments that were approved, where uh, in exchange, so almost sort of as a gift, essentially, if, if you're going to give me this uh, a little additional uh, capacity to build, it would, you know, they were donating actually money. And rather than have it go to, you know, some negotiated backroom deal, it was going to go into a benefits fund. Mm -hmm. And now they've been doing things like needs assessments 
to determine which nonprofits are actually need. We, I'm still not quite sure how they uh, go for it, how they how you apply for the funding, but apparently there's a real crying need from the local nonprofits now for uh, in this day and age for funding just to continue their missions, right? And uh, um, and I, I've heard some discussion about maybe there's a much more systematic and more uh, effective way of actually generating uh, um, donation. You know, you know, maybe the city can actually assist, uh, uh, you know, groups like the Cambridge Foundation, whatever, to actually uh, uh, significantly increase the amount of money that becomes available to run some of these. So, so the city council has been talking about this. Uh, can they do that legally? You know, the thing is, is it's it's sort of like there, there's what you do with like part of city departments and city programs, and then there are kind of. Uh, 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 you know, non-profit entities that sort of work in conjunction Maybe with that's city. public right. private partner thing you're talking about. Right. And so it would be similar. A lot lots of nonprofits get um, sort of government funding, whether that's from sort of a city or the state or right. the mm -hmm. federal government. Right. And so um, it would sometimes that's just a sort of lump sum, sometimes it's to deliver a specific service. Um, and it all depends on I think who can do it best and who can be right. do it best most efficiently. Mm -hmm. right. Actually, the uh, truth is, is that oftentimes the reason that there is funding for nonprofits is that there's a recognition, at least in different branches of government, that nonprofits as a service deliverers actually do a better job than the government does directly. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, yeah. it's money well spent mm -hmm. if you can fund such and such an agency who are gonna do things for, I'm sure it's not a dime on the dollar, but you know, more effectively. Yeah, and so a lot of, you know, we're having this national local connection. Um, so a lot of the conversation at the national level has been, uh, can you show me your impact? And this is now flooding lots of nonprofits. And so they need a lot more support in how to do that because collecting data is expensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but with some kind of support from the city in how to set that up, and the city has a great data analyst <laughs> and, and um, department. Our city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we there's we have great reports that I've been pouring through. Yes. And they're very easy to access, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. So we have mm -hmm. transparency in government and data and what's happening. You know about the open data portal stuff. Well, the open data portal. I thought there was some issue that it wasn't so yeah. transparent. But, but I, I don't yeah. know. My experience with the city yeah. has been that if you really really want something and you're a well-meaning person, you just you ask and people are really really cooperative in, in helping uh -huh. people and giving access to information. But you say a lot of yeah. it's online. Like yeah. Different. Yeah, and it's there for posterity, so you can look all the way back to the early aughts to see what was there and what kind of um, sort of data we were talking about at that time. Mm. For some of it, like inequality in housing, it hasn't really changed yeah. <laughs> for a while. Um, I think we've still had a lot more demand for living here in Cambridge than we've been able to mm -hmm. supply. Well, demand of, of certain kind of housing, I mean, there's... I don't know, it seems like there's lots of luxury type housing or housing that, you know, you can afford. Like all those big apartment buildings going on in Kendall. I mean, who's living there? I don't know. We tend to depend on the 20% on the inclusionary to provide the affordability with a presumption. I don't know if it's accurate, but a presumption that the other 80% are all luxury Units. Well, I don't, I not even luxury, but there. single, you know, someone making, you know, they're making maybe a three-figure salary, they're a single person, so they can afford to rent or own, I don't know, I, I was on the red line the other day, and just all those huge buildings, right, by, before you get to Charles Street. They rehabbed the one, they rehabbed right? the Harvard Tower. Who's right living there? I mean, there's a lot, yeah. I mean, around by the Galleria, those are yeah. big apartments. I'm shocked about that. Who's living well. there? Yeah, there's been a lot of, you know, so I'm just saying, they're not empty, so... I mean, I don't know. Well, some of the, some of the construction, like up in Alewife, um, they're, they're allowing X number of units on the market. You're talking about like behind, right. I know yeah, people live Yeah, I'm in the yeah. triangle. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if, you, if you actually, yeah. if they put them all out on the market all at the same time, yeah. they, the people might say, well, why should I be paying that what you're asking? Maybe the, the, the rents would go down, so they don't want to do that. So they're holding back, which I think is a little more. The reality is rents, there was an art the other day in the, in the Globe that nationally that a two-bedroom, to afford a two-bedroom apartment anywhere, a, a, a wage earner would have to get at least uh, $23 an hour. I mean, and most people aren't making that. 
do right. with it. So yeah, I'm just saying it's a big issue. It's a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We, we, have, we, have, uh, we actually should mention here. Yeah. So you have a you have a campaign kickoff coming up, ah. don't you? Yeah. Good so mention. as a this new candidate who um, is running for the first time, one of the reasons why I wanted to come and just introduce myself and chat a little bit is to try to say hi to more people. And so uh, I have a website. It's voteadrian.com. And I don't know if you can and see. And that's Adrian well, actually, with an E at the yeah. end. Yeah. Hold it here and then we can Fresh. switch to this one. Maybe this we can one see here? it. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're right, going <laughs> to try our best there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, this Saturday, uh, the 24th, from 4 to 6 p.m. at Christopher's in Porter Square. I think it'll be a great party. We'll have some apps. Um, okay. And we'll drinks here. and lots of new And you cars. have a website? Yep. Vote. Adrian.com. Yep, voteadrian.com. A D R I A N E. I'm so again, so that's this Saturday, June 24th, 4 to 4 6 p.m. at Christopher's. Okay. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, all right. So we got we got just another minute and a change here to go here. So you want to just sort of make a final pitch final here? Final pitch. Like why why should you the voter vote yeah. for Adrian? You, you need the number one vote. Right? And, not, and number one. <laughs> right. That's right. So I think. You know, one of the things that I've been interested in these issues for a really long time, my husband and I were married last year, and we are 100% committed to living in Cambridge, to raise our kids in Cambridge. It's just, we're so lucky to live in Cambridge, and I would like to allow more people to have that opportunity. I'd also like us to continue to move forward on the progressive issues that we all believed in and we all were hoping would happen at a national level. So if you are engaged at the national level and you haven't thought about what's happening here in Cambridge, and you haven't been ha thinking about what's happening in your backyard, I really recommend that you get involved and uh, reach out and talk to me because I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm going to work hard to make sure that we continue to move forward. Great. Well, that's pretty great. So yeah. it's going to be an exciting election uh, yes. year. Yes, stay tuned. Uh, so uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, we'll tune in next week on Cambridge Inside Out. Thanks a lot.